So in the last video, we talked about some of the basics of genetics. Um, and before we go any further, we're going to talk about some old ideas and some also old ideas, but better ideas. Now, before we actually understood how traits were inherited, the thought was that every sperm cell had a tiny little fully formed human with a head and arms and legs and everything um, inside the sperm cell. Or the other idea was that the blood of parents somehow blended to produce offspring that looked like a mix of both mom and dad. However, these ideas did not really pan out once we understood what was actually going on. So these were both mistaken ideas, and we can't really fault people for believing this stuff back then because this was popular from the 16 to the 1800s, well before we actually really understood what genetics were, and well before what we knew thing about things like DNA and genes. But there was a big question that could not be answered uh, by either of those previous ideas, and that was basically how did some traits suddenly appear, like if you have a, a child with blue eyes and both of the parents have brown eyes? The person who really addressed that question was Gregor Mendel. And Gregor Mendel is really considered the father of genetics. He applied the scientific method to learn about how traits were inherited in pea plants. Um, and lucky for him, pea plants genetics are pretty simple. So he was able to come up with some really awesome um, ideas and awesome theories as to what was going on. So what he did is he would cross plants by pollinating different plants to produce many different types of offspring. And we're gonna look at some of those crosses. And he established true breeding plants that always produced offspring with the same variant. So he would basically breed purple flowered pea plants over and over and over again until the offspring were always purple and no other colors like white would pop up. So he did that. He produced these true breeding plants for things like flower color, seed shape, plant height, and then would cross two individuals together who had different traits. So for example, one would have purple flowers and the other would have white. And what he noticed is that when he did that, he produced all purple offspring. But then when he crossed those purple offspring, then the white trait would come back. And it was that uh, phenomenon that really caught his attention and really got him digging deep into the scientific method to figure out what was going on with these traits. So this is kind of what he was looking at. So he picked pea plants because they were very easy to maintain, very, very easy to grow and breed, and they reproduced very quickly. So he could have multiple generations um, in his experiment in a very short period of time. They also had traits that were easily categorized. Things like flower color would be purple or white. The peas shape could be round or wrinkled and the peas color could be green or yellow. And he also looked at things like pod color, pod shape, flower position, and plant height as well. But we're gonna focus mainly on just a couple of these. He could create populations that were distinct. So the true breeding plants, meaning that anytime he bred purple flowers, he would get only purple flowers for offspring. And anytime he bred white flowers, he would only get white flowers for their offspring. So he asked these very specific questions and got very specific answers back. What will the result be if I cross two parents? Right? And what he saw was very particular patterns that allowed him to make predictions about future crosses that he had not even made yet. So when he did these experiments, we're talking about doing hundreds of plants, right? Counting hundreds of seeds and counting their colors and shapes and so on and so forth. So he didn't just do this once or twice, he did this many, 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 many times over. And one of the things he noticed when he did these experiments is that sometimes a trait would disappear in one generation only to reappear again in the next, and that the individuals were never in the true breeding group. So what he figured out was that one of these traits had, was somehow stronger and was able to mask the other trait in that generation. Now, it's important to note, this is well before we understood chromosomes, DNA, genes, all that kind of stuff. 
This is pre-genetic information age, right? He's really the one who's establishing this as even a concept, which is wild to think about. So he establishes the term dominant for the stronger ones and recessive for the masked traits. And those are terms we still use today. So in this case of flower color, purple was dominant and white was recessive. So purple flowers would dominate over white. He also noticed that if he took the two true breeding plants, bred them together and got the offspring, and then took those offspring from the second generation and bred them, that recessive trait would come back and it came back in a very specific ratio. Three dominant offspring for every one recessive. And so based off of this, he hypothesized these three things. That the parents are both contributing to the offspring. The offspring are getting two copies of the instructions for any trait they have. And that the, inherit, the trait that you see depends on the copies of the instructions you receive. So he took true breeding purple bred with true breeding white and all the offspring in the second generation were purple. He took two of those purple plants, bred them together, and now the white came back. So somehow the white trait stayed within the population or stayed within the lineage without showing in that second generation. So the true breeding plants that we were talking about earlier had two copies of the same allele. And so we would call that genotype homozygous. But when you're an individual and you get two different alleles, we call you heterozygous. And in the heterozygous individuals, the dominant allele can mask the recessive allele. So if we look at an individual who is capital D, capital D, so we have the same alleles for both, they're shown in capital letters to show their dominant alleles. This would be a homozygous dominant genotype showing the dominant trait. And we would show the alleles as capital D, capital D. If we had for this trait E, capital E, lowercase e, they're different alleles, so we are heterozygous. We have a dominant allele, so we show the dominant trait. And we have one dominant, one recessive allele. And if we are little f, little f down here, they're both the same allele, so homozygous, recessive. And since we have two recessive alleles, we have the recessive trait, and we show that with two lowercase letters. Notice that regardless if you're homozygous dominant or heterozygous, the outcome is the same. We both experience the dominant trait. And so you can't necessarily tell whether someone is homozygous dominant or heterozygous simply by looking at them. You would have to see the offspring they produce to know any further. Now Mendel created a couple laws um, that kind of describe what he saw. One is Mendel's law of segregation that says that only one copy of each gene will be in each gamete. And this is due to meiosis. And so we can confirm this from our previous unit. So what he's saying basically is that there were two different alleles, but only one allele can be chosen to be in a gamete. Right, only one, because it's going to be found in that chromosome. So you won't have two alleles for the same gene in a gamete. It's only going to be one. Now, remember that the genotype is talking about the genetic makeup of a person. But a person's phenotype is the physical manifestation, the physical appearance of the genotype. And so when we describe genes, we say homozygous recessive for whatever gene it is, like eye color. But when we're talking about a phenotype, we would say this person has blue eyes or brown eyes. When an organism exhibits a recessive trait, we know exactly what the genotype is. Now the question is why? Why can we tell immediately? When I mentioned earlier that you cannot tell the genotype of someone with a dominant trait. Why are we able to tell with the recessive? 
The big thing is, is that in order to show a recessive trait, both alleles have to be recessive. And since that's the case, that gives us only one option for genotype, homozygous recessive. If you're heterozygous or homozygous dominant, you have the dominant phenotype. And so we're not necessarily able to discern the genotype of someone with the dominant phenotype without looking at their offspring or their parents.